Good afternoon and a very uh, warm welcome to this online live streamed event to launch a RUSI research paper by Parity and Presence Deterring Russia with Conventional Land Forces, authored by Dr. Jack Watling. A particular welcome this afternoon to those in uniform who are joining us and to those RUSI members who are with us this afternoon. The paper we're talking about was launched today on our website at 1300 this afternoon, just an hour ago, and challenges some of those contemporary orthodoxies about what deterrence is and perhaps what it should be. Now, deterrence as a term has become in many ways synonymous with nuclear capability since the end of the Cold War. And forgotten were those hard won lessons that deterrence as a concept was so much more. In an era of great power competition, that change is critical and understanding how to go about it in today's environment above, below and around the threshold of armed response is absolutely vital. The author of this paper, uh, Jack Watling, is a research fellow at RUSI responsible for the study of land warfare. He's recently published detailed studies of the British Army's strike concepts, achieving lethal effects with small UAVs, Iran strategic capabilities, British training assistance programs in Yemen, uh, and he's also published on with the um, allies on multi-domain operations and on future of fires, as well as uh, longer papers. And his future pipeline is packed as well. Uh, prior to joining Rusi, Jack worked as a, a journalist in Iraq, Mali, Rwanda, Brunei, and further away. Uh, he embedded with Iraq's PMF and with the Bikini Faso Army. Originally, as I say, as a journalist, he contributed to Reuters, the Atlantic, Foreign Policy, The Guardian, James, you name it, he's been there. He was shortlisted for the European Press Prize Distinguished Writing Award in 2016 and won the Breakaway Award at the International Media Awards in 2017. We're also joined today and delighted to be joined by Major General John Mead, uh, who is Chief of Staff at HQ ARC. Uh, John was commissioned into the Royal Artillery some time ago. Uh, he was troop commander with 29th Commando Regiment uh, and saw some action uh, and deployments in Belize, Bosnia, Kosovo, Fingal, Iraq on Telic 1. Uh, he deployed on Highbrow, the non-combatant evacuation operation from Lebanon, and has commanded at all levels, uh, ending up in uh, Afghanistan on operational deployments uh, five or even six times. Uh, he's commanded numerous positions, but really culminated with Commander First Artillery Brigade in August 2016. And in August last year, he took up his current role as Chief of Staff HQ ARC, the Allied Rapid Reaction Corps. That formation itself was formed out of the UK's first British Corps. And at the end of the Cold War, that formation became the Allied Rapid Reaction Corps. Now, many people often forget that the UK hosts and contributes 60% of the manpower for a core level HQ as the framework nation. Indeed, with the internal focus of the UK very much being on the warfighting division over the past few years, one might even be forgiven for forgetting what the core level is. Now, a core level is established to command between three and five divisions. The core level works at what historically known as the higher tactical level, but today seems to be more appropriate to what we call the operational level of war. What a core might be responsible for in contemporary conflict is an interesting question itself. But HQ Arc has a full, if somewhat short history, including deployments to Bosnia, Kosovo and Afghanistan in command. If there's one formation at this level that is thinking about what it takes to command several division against today's competitors, it's HQ Arc. Now, I don't want to steal Jack's thunder, so I'm going to leave him to make the remarks. And then I'm going to ask John Mead to add something as a sort of moderator to come on, on the back of it shortly afterwards. And on completion of that, we'll take questions until uh, we're due to stop at 1500 sharp. Now, these questions are to come from you. And I'd be grateful if you would type your questions into the question answer function. You'll find that at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Pop that open, top it, and I will pull out uh, the best questions, the themes, depending on how many they are, and I will push them to the panelists and see what we get. But on that, Jack, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Peter, and good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to present to you this afternoon. 
Um, so deterrence and the language of deterrence is something that we hear all the time. Why are we sending a battle group here? It's deterrence. Why uh, did we do Trident Juncture? We're messaging deterrence. Why are we talking about potentially sending a carrier to uh, Singapore? Because we want to deter something. But there is a fundamental problem in the way that we talk about deterrence. In that it's always around what we're doing, and it's not around the message that the person or group that we're trying to deter is receiving. You know, if we think about Trident Juncture, while it was really important to go hear the NATO members around a large exercise, from Russia's point of view, what that looked like was that NATO can pull together in six months one not particularly coherent divisional sized force in Norway, uh, conduct some quite scripted maneuvers, uh, at the end of which, when the script ended, we managed to sink one of our own frigates. Now, I'm not quite sure what the message the Russians received from that was, but there is a really dangerous mismatch often in the way we talk about deterrence, because it's not adversary centric. That's not necessarily saying that the activity we do doesn't send a message, but that very often the public discourse doesn't talk about what that message is and what we're trying to deter. So the paper that we've just published is trying to look at what, how deterrence actually functions, uh, how, what the Russians are trying to achieve, what their activity that we might want to deter looks like, how it might be deterred, and then from that, what does that mean in terms of resourcing, both in a NATO context and for the UK more specifically? Now, I'm not going to be able to cover all of that today uh, in presenting. I'm just going to kind of give out the key headlines um, and then hopefully we can have a conversation. But it's quite a long paper. It ended up being about 30,000 words. So there's a lot to dig into. And the first third is largely about the theory, which is probably the thing I'm going to go lightest on right now. The one point I would really stress, though, is that deterrence has to be psychological. It is about what the other side perceives and thinks. And it is about their decision making and influencing their decision making. That has to be the ultimate way of judging whether or not you've succeeded. It's in whether they do not pursue courses of action that are threatening to us. Now, in terms of a country that is threatening to the UK and its interests, uh, the Russian Federation, unfortunately, is probably at the top of that list. Um, in 2014, of course, they annexed Crimea. They continue to sponsor uh, disruptive activity and violent attacks in Ukraine. They are alleged to be sponsoring attacks on coalition forces in Afghanistan. There have been numerous clashes between themselves and the US in Syria. They're now operating in Libya. Um, and of course, there was the poisoning of Soviet Skripal uh, and therefore the use of a nerve agent by the Russian military on British soil. So we are in a state of competition, certainly with the Russians. And in that context, it's important to understand why, where their thinking is and why they do what they do. So in the paper, I break down the Russian strategy into four main headlines, um, kind of main strategic interests that are quite interrelated. The first is their status as a great power. Um, the second is their pursuit of regional hegemony. The third is their wish to assure their national sovereignty. And the fourth is the defense of regime survival. Um, now, these things we often uh, treat quite separately, but in the Russian conception, they're very, very interrelated. So if we think about great power status, the capacity to project force internationally, to make yourself uh, an indispensable voice that has to be consulted on the world stage whenever there are conflicts and issues, the Russians have become increasingly engaged uh, and willing to use force, whether covert or overt, around the world, inserting themselves into international disputes. Now, that isn't, some of that is opportunistic economic activity, pursuit of very much local um, openings that they perceive, and it's quite tactical. But there is a wider strategic intent behind it. And as an example, I would highlight Libya. Um, I remember having multiple conversations with Russian officials in early 2018 about Libya, and they were kind of going on about how Khalifa Haftar is a complete joke, uh, you know, they really don't have any interest there. They've been messed around in Libya ever since the days of the Soviet Union, you know, and yet we've seen a progressive expansion of Russian activity in the country. And the reason for that is that it allows them to engage in a complex discussion with a wide range of European partners and Middle Eastern partners on a bilateral basis, whereby if we want any progress in Libya, we have to take Russia's interests to heart 
And if we end up threatening Russia's interests in their periphery, they can suddenly cause us a lot of problems in the Middle East. Um, we saw that in uh, Syria with the timing of the attack on Idlib late last year in December, specifically designed to exacerbate refugee flows into Turkey. And so they use great power status as a way of coercively linking issues so that it gets leverage over things that they consider to genuinely be their critical interest. The problem for the UK, some of the activity internationally that doesn't have anything to do with us, but some of it, especially when we look at competition in the Gulf, where the UK has long-term strategic interests, if opportunities present themselves, could really upset and threaten British interests. So there are Russian courses of action that we may wish to deter. In terms of regional hegemony, People often kind of go, well, why is it that Russia is always meddling in its neighbor's affairs? And I think there is a rationale to this, which is that throughout Russian history, you know, it hasn't had settled borders. It's got 13 time zones or it spans 13 time zones. It has massive borders. Historically, there have been nomadic populations that have moved across them. And many of their adversaries in the past, whether that be Poland or Turkey, uh, have sponsored the activities of those ethnic groups to disrupt across the border inside Russia. Um, and so there was a really long historical memory in Russia, which basically draws the lesson that if you don't have strategic depth, then you can't practice defense in depth, which has been critical to their defeat of Napoleon and Hitler. Um, and if you don't have project, if you don't project strength across your border, and if you're not strong over your border, then the trouble is likely to come back the other way and be disrupted for you. So they have an interest there. But the way they pursue securing their uh, border is in several ways. Firstly, they try and engage their border, their neighboring states in multilateral frameworks, whether that be the Arctic Council uh, or the Eurasian Union. Secondly, they try and build up dependencies, and those are economic, military, uh, cultural. And so again, the Eurasian Union is quite an interesting example of that. But if we look at someone like Belarus, Russia sells oil to Belarus occasionally down to four dollars a barrel, and that was before coronavirus, because they essentially, in making countries dependent upon Russian natural resources, routes of supply, it means that on the one hand, the country benefits, on the other hand, if the country wants to do anything that isn't in Russia's interest, then they, Russia has quite a lot of coercive leverage. And there is a darker side to that as well, whereby Russia coerces and essentially builds leverage over elites in those states through encouraging corrupt business practices. And this is something that President Putin has pursued personally for a very long time. He used to do it for the KGB um, in, in East Germany. But essentially, it's about bringing foreign officials, foreign businessmen into corrupt practices so that if they don't line up with Russian interests, you, can, you know where all the dirty washing is. You can expose it to law enforcement, whether that's Russian law enforcement acting against them or essentially dropping it into the hands of law enforcement abroad, pursuing them through courts, even the British courts, um, and thereby coercing those states into aligning with Russian interests. And in some cases, for the UK, that's a big problem. The third element is this issue of uh, national sovereignty. And I want to highlight there the fact that when we talk about national sovereignty, you know, we think in terms of our border protection, but for the Russians, the experience of the 1990s, an economic collapse, um, at what they perceived and capital flight, the rise of the oligarchs, the destruction of their status as a great power, the perception by many Russian officials is that the West had taken advantage of them, that capitalism had been used against them, and because they were weak, uh, their sovereignty was impinged. And so there was a desire in the project to make sure that never happens again. But the problem with this sort of, and then the fourth one is regime survival. And the one point I'd make there is that we often think about that as protection of Putin and his cronies. That is an element of it. But there is also an element, which is that without a strong center, there is a belief that the Russian state will crumble, as happened in the 1990s. And so regime protection is actually a strategic issue. And one of the things I would flag from deterrence is that there's this big debate that we're having at the moment about the balance between cyber information and conventional hard power. And the reality is that for the Russians, if you go after them through information operations, if you go after them and pursue a policy of what they would call color revolutions, trying to shape the Russian government through information uh, and propaganda, that threatens their core strategic interest. You are in an information war at that stage. Whereas kinetic conventional activity, even if it leads to Russian servicemen being killed in some cases, is within certain bounds understood as a process of kinetic negotiation. 
So our thresholds don't line up with theirs, is the first point. And things that we consider sub-threshold are not necessarily to them. That's the first point. But now I just want to move slightly into what does this mean for the UK? Well, for the UK, our first priority is obviously to make sure that Russia doesn't pursue uh, policies like face complete operations against NATO territory, but also against other partners, whether that be in the Balkans or the high north, which Russia may have strategic interests in doing at some point. And the point I'd highlight with that is that whenever you talk to Russian analysts, national security people, they tell you, well, Russia's never going to really go in for that, right? They're not actually going to go and invade NATO, which I think is true today. But the problem with that is that in 2013, uh, in the autumn of 2013, it would also have been the case that the Russian government did not intend to invade Ukraine. And the reason for that is that the Russians have pursued for two decades a policy of trying to integrate themselves economically with Ukraine, making it an ally and binding it to them economically through the Eurasian Union, which the invasion had the opposite effect of achieving that goal. So it was a fundamental break with the past of Russian foreign policy, which was pursued in response to a crisis, which was threatening not just, in fact, uh, their interests in Ukraine, but also, as far as Putin was concerned, potentially threatening instability in Russia. Now, the critical point there is that that means for deterrence activity, there are two sides to it. There's the short-term or rather continuous activity, which is, you know, exercises, uh, moving your troops around, showing what you can do, the capabilities you have. That's continuous. What that does is it reinforces the technical assessments of the other side in terms of what they can do, what's possible. But the other side of it is in a crisis when the options are presented to the other party, that's also a point when you need to maximize deterrent activity. You need to move fast, you need to message very clearly, and you need to express your threshold so that when the choices are laid out in front of Putin next time round, he doesn't make the same decision that he did in 2014, which is that invasion of another foreign state, uh, sovereign state, is both doable and in Russia's interests. Now, so this raises an interesting challenge for NATO because um, there's the activity and competition, which we can talk about maybe more in the Q&A, or I might get to if I have time. But in a conflict context, if you are going to deter Russia, they can mobilize a field army, Russian field army, so core size formation, pretty quickly in about four weeks with modernized weaponry um, in the Western military district. Now, for us, that is a very, very large buildup. And the problem that we have is that we can't, while we could put a force that could defeat that on the border at any given point, there are several thousand kilometers of border. It could happen in a number of places for varying reasons, um, whether it be you know, a small land grab in the high north to challenge Article 5, or a issue that breaks out in the Balkans that the Russians feel they have to intervene in, where actually, we can't have troops everywhere because then that's a very threatening posture where we have a very large force package that we can't afford on Russia's border. So the challenge we have is how do we build up? And if we think about being able to prevent that uh, conventional military application of force in a crisis, the size of force you're talking about for NATO is about seven to nine divisions being required. Um, about seven maneuver divisions or six to seven maneuver divisions and then other infantry divisions to hold the ground. Um, about two to three course worth of troops. Now, at the moment, NATO has two challenges. Firstly, it doesn't have that size force that it can readily deploy. The force exists across the alliance, but it can't get it there in time. And the second real issue is that a lot of countries, while they say they have divisions, really don't. Um, and I'll speak to the UK on that because I think it's, well, you know, mark our own homework and before we go and criticize others. Um, but this is a pretty wide problem across NATO. If we think about a division doctrinally, armored division in warfighting, you're looking at around 200 main battle tanks. It used to be 227 in a British division. The Russians have 322 in a tank division and um, just over 200, about 214 in a motor rifle division. We currently have 112 as the complement. And it's not just 112 main battle tanks, but it's 112 quite old main battle tanks, which are increasingly not competitive with what the Russians are fielding. Um, and so while we say we have a division, we haven't resourced it. Um, partly because we stretch ourselves up over too many policy options. And I think one of the big challenges for the UK is that we face a pretty tough choice in a stretched resource environment where across NATO, we need to have a conversation about how do we rationalize our force structure 
and is the UK's contribution a division? Because that would genuinely be a useful thing, but there are others that can provide that. And if it's not, then what do we provide? One of the critical deficiencies that other countries really struggle to fulfill is what we might call a recce strike framework, which is a very, very significant level of artillery and very high fidelity sensors uh, combined with resilient C2 that connects up to a higher echelon that can enable the other NATO maneuver elements or divisions to actually go and do their job. Because at the moment, the US Marine Corps is trying to build that. The Americans might be able to field it um, if they can pull it in in time. But the UK has very limited fires capability and other NATO countries have also lost a lot of their fires capability. So that really becomes a higher echelon capability. And where the UK faces a particular challenge in that space in terms of where it pushes its resource is that not only if we do succeed in deterring conflict, then we face this challenge of competition, which could be global. And the interesting thing is that Russia, in terms of competition, while it is prepared to use force against our interests in, say, the Gulf or uh, Libya or Syria or Africa, its power to project force is only at about brigade strength. So while you need responsive forces to be able to get into position and uh, define British interests in a space and then either deter through denial, preventing the Russians from doing something, or punishment, inflicting damage upon them if they do do it, as the Americans did to the uh, Wagner group in Syria, then you need to be able to be present, which means you need good access to theatre, you need good relationships with local partners, and you do need about a brigade-sized force that you can deploy. Um, and so one of the challenges for the UK is, I think, do we increasingly go down a war fighting uh, only focused structure, or that's where we put the predominance of our resources, where we have a fully armed division that we can get to theatre in time to have that conventional deterrent effect? Or do we put our resource into a recce strike framework uh, and into the C2 elements and maintain our light infantry uh, in a more deployable manner so that with those things, we can either provide a higher echelon capability, which is one of the things that's missing to NATO, but also have a more deployable, because it's lighter, type of force that we can spread out in that competitive space. Um, and I think that's one of the real, actually, unless you're going to significantly increase the amount of resource, uh, hard choices facing us with regards to the integrated review. So I know I've been whispering on for a while, but we can get into some of this in Q&A. So uh, I will relinquish my time to the chair and to General John. Um, and look forward to unpacking some of it. But I, I urge you to go and read the paper to look at some of the theory and context behind all of this. Uh, thanks, Jack. That was a, a really good intro, Chair. And I think one of the things I, I will ask you to do as a follow up after we've heard from uh, General John in a minute is just to go back over that linkage between the conceptual and the capability. Uh, you, you skipped over it. You cover it in, I think the paper covers it beautifully, but I might ask you just to go back over that after General John as sort of my first question to you, to do that linking between the two, because I think you outline the Russian problem very well, and then you disappear down into the sort of capability choices. But that, that essence about land forces and deterrence is something is something that I think you know, the audience uh, and I certainly want to hear from. But in the meantime, let's hand over to uh, General John. Peter Jack, um, thank you, and uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so my name is John Mead. I'm a, a major general in the British Army, but here today in my primary guise as a, a NATO officer, and, and, and more specifically, uh, Chief of Staff of the Allied Rapid Reaction Corps, ARC. Uh, I'm responding to Jack's work, firstly uh, and foremost, because I, I commissioned the paper with Rusi at the start of this year, as we sought to better we, we sought to better understand deterrence. And firstly, wanted just to congratulate him, I think, on what's a really thorough and important piece of work, which is also coming through with some of the, the feedback we're getting on the Q&A panel. Uh, you know, really, regardless of your opinions on where the cursor should lie on some of the choices uh, he's just highlighted, and I think highlighted very clearly, it's just such an important conversation. Um, you know, this, this aspect of better understanding and unifying our actions behind, you know, what is 21st century deterrence? Uh, it's a conversation that's really important to us and has recently been accelerated through NATO's concept for deterrence and defence of the Euro-Atlantic area, a bit of a mouthful, but DDA uh, for short. Uh, and just in a couple of minutes now, I'm just hoping to offer, uh, as well as my congratulations, a bit of a practitioner's eye on, on why this work is relevant uh, to NATO as, 
as NATO does pursue um, in, in all its language and its deeds, an, an, an ambitious adaptation agenda, but there's some tough choices there. Little did I imagine I was gonna to have to sing for my supper here, but um, honored to be here at the RUSI webinars on Zoom have become very much part of our staple diet. So uh, just a bit of context, uh, this particular story started back at a very different uh, RUSI launch in Whitehall during uh, the launch of Jack's excellent Future Fires paper where we got into a conversation that Jack has just alluded to concerning long range fires, the threat of fires, uh, Russia's A2, AD, anti-access and aerial denial capabilities, and, and really how A2, AD has been used to garner influence, not just in conflict, but also in competition. Uh, you know, related uh, is the conversation on US, uh, the concept for multi-domain operations, and recent UK work on multi-domain integration both played into the discussion. Uh, and hence, we and our, just wanted a bit of more of a contemporary academic view of deterrence, uh, because you know, what deters is not static. It's not a static position. Uh, and we felt warranted greater understanding, principally from a practical purposes uh, as part of our readiness journey. And, and first off, I'd say, I think that cognitive calculus, those aspects in the paper, this psychological process you know, to convince a potential adversary not to pursue a particular course of action, I think is covered really well in the paper. But it also suggests, I think as Jack alluded to, that we need to think more deeply about how our actions are perceived and be more targeted um, in those actions. So that's the background. I, I thought I'd just offer three very brief points as to relevance, and they really relate to, you know, the way that we plan, planning, operating, and, and this all important point for NATO of unity of effort. So firstly, in terms of planning and plans, uh, there's a lot going on. I, I won't relive the history lesson from NATO summits back in 2014 from Wales, Warsaw, Brussels, the recent 2019 leaders meeting um, in, in London. They're, they're all the subject of public record. But all place, uh, you know, very specifically a greater um, emphasis on a nuanced and more nuanced approach to credible deterrence. You know, Russia is NATO's declared most significant long-term challenge. The recent London declaration explicitly stated Russians' actions are a threat to the alliance, but also set out you know, a strong adaptation pathway for NATO. So, you know, NATO on the one hand does not seek to prevent, uh, to provoke, um, and has a, a, has a really kind of has taken a bit of a dual track approach here and a stated dual track approach to Russia, which is very much on the one hand, uh, strength and deterrence and defense, but backed up with some hard edged um, and hard headed dialogue. But what's so, I, I think it's important to convey what's changed recently. Uh, and as recently as June was the political endorsement of DDA, which I previously have referred to, which is now, is now permeating down the chain of command as it started to be implemented and operationalized. But it's a big deal. It's a big deal for headquarters such as ARC as we, as we seek to better target those two key effects, deter and defend. And, and I do feel that jo Jack's paper is a very worthy contribution in this sense, because uh, it recognises deterrence is, just, is not just something related to conflict in NATO Article 5, but boy, that's really, really important. But it's also a crucial effect in this, this area of constant competition, the, the Article 3 space. And I think, as he just alluded to in his introduction, we need to think through and war game some of those, um, those aspects uh, as you move from effectively in Article 3 into Article 4 or 5 space and what, what that might mean. So as we try and both unify efforts, but also maximise the power of combinations. Uh, the paper does cover this um, and, and talks about this balance of multi-domain capabilities. Um, with this greater focus on cyber and space domains. Um, but for us, and that's important, that's really important to us as we prepare for readiness, but it's also meant a doubling down in the joint arena and the significance of that integration between air, maritime and land, uh, and the land domain being the most complex because it's, it's where the people are. So I think the paper you know, really does a, a very, you know, very worthy job of, of highlighting that crucial shaping activity, the capable and credible points that Jack makes uh, with that contested grain zone activity, crucially underpinned by hard power. So second point, and I'll, and I'll, I'll accelerate a wee bit, is I think 
this aspect of readiness and how we use readiness, um, it, it relates not only to NATO's recent declarations about a culture of readiness, but also manifested in the, the NATO Readiness Initiative and, and things like the forward deployment on enhanced uh, forward presence. Uh, you know, as a very direct result, ARP also assumed readiness as NATO's warfighting corps headquarters in, in January of this year, which is, which is a first for NATO since the fall of the Berlin Wall. But, you know, it's different readiness. We need to constantly adjust and calibrate our presence profile and posture. And that presence point is, you know, quite deliberately part of the title of, of Jack's paper. We've got to be competitive. We've got to be more effective. Because, you know, our actions do have effect. Um, our regular deployments, for example, for ARC into, into Europe on capacity building and mentoring activities with countries such as Estonia, uh, recently Romania uh, and Ukraine are, you know, are deeply significant. So where we deploy, what scale, with who matters a great deal. Uh, and, and it's this aspect of thinking about deterrence more significantly and utilising readiness uh, as an, en a, an engine for engagement with our allies and partners to fine tune our posture, to, to support that changing NATO uh, strategic intent. I think it's worth pointing out that when we commissioned this work back in January, we were also gearing up uh, to take part in the uh, exercise Defender Europe exercise. It's a very large scale, end of the spectrum, deeply impressive US led exercise across Europe, where we achieved a great deal, even though the exercise was ultimately curtailed. But we'll be involved again next year and, and beyond. Uh, and the point is that the posture matters, as does interoperability, which I think came across you know, very strongly from Secretary McCarthy's point uh, yesterday in Rusi. Uh, finally, uh, the, the all important unity of effort point uh, and constantly strengthening the alliance. Uh, I think Jack's paper makes some very direct and interesting points with regard to persistent engagement. He talks about the DA network, but it, um, and, and more broadly, how we, we join those sinews. Uh, unity of effort in NATO doctrine is delivered through this key in order to effect um, in, in that we, which we seek to achieve and deterrence is directly in our mission statement and NATO formations maintain a constant network across domains in order to deter. But we could do, and this is the point, we could do more to be more targeted and achieving that effect, building interoperability, frankly, more systematically, although it's a deeply important part of what we do. And this includes with the US who are, as you, as you heard yesterday, if you were on the, um, the, the RUSI webinar, they're accelerating at an incredible pace. So um, ARC, just by way of example, you know, we're 21 nations, 21 of the 30 NATO nations, which builds you know, a fantastic network, um, which includes direct links into our nine sister NATO core headquarters. We're about to deploy with three of them on exercise in, in November. And it's such a strength uh, and we could make even more of it as we start to implement DDA. By way of another example, we're working extremely closely now with a new multinational course southeast in Romania as it stands up and takes a leading defensive role uh, in, in the Black Sea region. And I've seen a few questions coming in uh, about that particular area of the world. So a key part of this as well is the US, that the incredible commitments they've made under the US uh, European Deterrence Initiative, which doesn't get talked about enough sometimes, with the Defender series of exercises being just one part. And, and you could mention on the NATO side, Jeff and CGF initiatives in the, in the same breath. But we're unified through the clarity of our thinking and the credibility and capability to act. Uh, but there are some tough choices, which I think the paper covers, covers really well. That balance of hard and soft power, uh, indeed, you know, this risk that conventional deterrence could be undervalued as in effect, nothing negative happens, which of, which of course is the point. Uh, it's, it's much less costly. So um, that, that's me. I think ARC had relatively modest aims for commissioning this paper, which, you know, Jack and Rusi have far exceeded in terms of 21st century deterrence. I, I hope my, you know, relatively tactical contribution has been of some use from a practitioner's eyes charged with being ready for war fighting roles, but, but frankly, more effective and integrated in the persistent uh, competition of today. Thank you. John, thanks very much and, and very well. I think we'll, we'll blend together your, your experiences, but I, I do just wanna go back to Jack and, and try and link the concepts, which I think you covered the, the you know, subject of deterrence uh, 
uh, is absolutely critical to this, but also then link it down to the capability choices because your focus on Russia, you know, you articulate the position over almost what is acceptable. You know, what is a, you know, that the kinetic engagement is some way a, a part of an acceptable negotiation strategy. And, and you know, even human losses, those tied up in resources are, are a given. That's just part of what competition is. But it, then it strikes me by saying that, you know, and therefore we compete with them on that level by investing in this capability. That seems like we're matching them and sort of mirroring it, now, we're not seeking advantage. We're playing the sort of infinite game of a, of a competition, which I get. But that posture itself doesn't strike me exactly as deterrence. It strikes me as meeting and matching them. It might be containment, but it doesn't strike me as deterrence. I wonder if you could just dig in and a little bit between the concept and the capability, because I know you've got it very clear and it's very clearly outlined in the paper, and just allow some of our um, listeners to, to, to tap into some of that. Sure. Um, so, you know, if you are going to convince somebody that a course of action is not viable um, or that they're going to receive so much damage doing it that they shouldn't try it, which is essentially what you're, you know, those are the two options of deterrence, essentially. Um, then you, the best way to do that is to look at the points of vulnerabilities in how they operate and what they do and focus on that because you can achieve the deterrent effect with a lot less effort. Um, and a good example of this would be in competition. You know, the Russians will look for opportunities to get invited in, will look for theatre entry that is unopposed. They do not have a history of forcing theatre access. They don't have the capability to do it in most places. Um, and so if you can get there first and set up even a relatively small force um, at the request of the host nation, um, then you essentially freeze them out. Which, to give you an example of where this actually has been done, um, in Iraq, the Russians have been trying to build a joint intelligence hub with the Iraqi military for several years now, to fight Daesh, um, and it hasn't gotten anywhere because we were there first, we provide much more useful capabilities than the Russians can offer, uh, and ultimately our line is, look, don't let the Russians in if you want to work with us, uh, and the Iraqis make the sensible choice on that. So by having the right capability, which is good I-star assets, um, some military intelligence support, and the liaison officers to work with the Iraqi army, you can freeze out Russia from the theatre, and then you don't have to worry about it. They're not going to get in. Uh, so you don't need to worry about all of the capability they bring to bear. Um, and so, you know, I think it is about thinking about where those points of leverage are. Um, the same, you know, when we talk about uh, what happened in Ukraine, you have to separate what happened in Crimea, which was a conventional military operation to seize land in a very normal way. You know, taking your unit badges off your uniform doesn't actually make you uh, a deniable asset, right? It, it maybe makes things a little confusing, but that's not what that is. That's still a conventional military operation. You just changed your badges. Um, what happened in Donbass, where they did genuinely develop local proxies, sent in lots of special forces uh, in cities uh, or not in uniform, um, and then sort of dialed things in and used a lot of undeclared artillery strikes they refused to acknowledge to support those. That's a different strategy. Um, but the fact that the Russians are, are not prepared to declare that the activity is their own is also a message that they don't want to go across certain thresholds. Um, because if they were happy doing it, they would do it themselves, as they did in Crimea. So recognizing that distinction and the fact that actually, okay, they are... Uh, accepting that they might take casualties and aren't necessarily seeing taking casualties as the same escalatory step in this context means that you can start inflicting damage, you can start inflicting punishment in that context. And that is a tactic that has worked in Syria. So in that environment where they want to remain deniable, there are long-range strike or air assets, um, hardening your allies' C2 capabilities that can be done, which are relatively small levels of effort, can message to Russia, don't escalate here, don't try and step this up, because we do actually care about this one. And, and that's really the, re the important thing, is understanding what military activity at what level messages the right effect. Um, so it's not about taking a hammer to every problem. But uh, and I, I get that, Jack, but you're talking now about pinpricks, you know, where, where you, you get leverage. Now, the sort of Cold War approach to deterrence, which many people are familiar with, is more of a sort of uh, 
highly orchestrated grand strategic view about leveraging not pinpricks but enormous great levers and economic sanctions in deployments of huge carrier groups uh, in challenging in the Arctic about overall posture. Are you saying that modern deterrence is very different? And then I will come on to that to pose a question to uh, John Mead in that if this isn't about pinpricks and it is about orchestrating, you know, much more across these pinpricks instead of just a small land force deployment, is HQR the sort of formation that is the one that crosses those domains? So instead of it just being a special forces deployment or a, uh, you know, enhanced forward pleasant deployment, it might also be dealing with uh, a maritime deployment or a submarine. It might also be dealing with um, you know, an Air Force uh, policing mission. It might be dealing with, you know, deployment of drones. Is this the future of the core level in NATO? But to Jack first. So I think during the Cold War, you know, Russian war plans were to get to Portugal within a couple of weeks uh, or a few weeks, right? Of things kicking off in Germany. Uh, I mean, you know, so, so the Soviet scale of operations that they were envisaging were global. We're not in that space. The Russians don't have the mass for it, they don't have the capability for it. While they can sustain an army group, one country uh, out from their border, uh, you get two countries out and that drops to a division. You get three countries out and that drops to a brigade in terms of their sustaining capabilities. So the Russians aren't playing that game. No one is, no one has the mass. Um, it is about much smaller competition. Uh, and therefore I think the dynamics are different. However, small, activities in competition can have really significant strategic effects. You know, we've seen uh, China take territory off India, really small slices of territory, um, and the Indians have not been prepared to escalate to take them back. Now, just as a hypothetical, let's say that was done in the high north against NATO, um, or, or frankly in the Baltics against NATO. I think it plays very differently in the Baltics, but in the high north where difficult to get to, the Russians have the VDB division, uh, prepared for Arctic operations, they drop a division of paratroops in. Um, the level of escalation required to dislodge them would be politically very challenging. But if we don't dislodge them, or more importantly, if beforehand we don't demonstrate that we are able and willing to dislodge them if they were to go in, then Article 5 is invalidated. Uh, and all of a sudden, the credibility of the alliance collapses, and then Russia can deal bilaterally with all of its neighbours in the manner that I described, where it starts building up coercive leverage and then cranking them in to uh, align with Russian interests and be subordinated to Russian interests. So even though we are talking quite tactical actions, uh, increasingly those actions have really substantial consequences. And John, uh, you know, the, the future of the core in terms of orchestrating more domains than simply land? Yeah, so I, you know, we, we pitch ourselves as being multi-domain by design. I think it, it, initially that's mostly about the way that we can unify efforts across the five uh, domains better and to greater effect to converge and achieve those, as I was talking about, those power of, of, of combinations. I think that also relates to the networked point. Uh, some of that is about forward posture and our links into... Um, training teams that we, we operate a, across Eastern Europe and, and some of that forward engagement. But, but most significantly also, it's, the, it's our nine sister corps that we train with routinely. Um, and the other domains in terms of um, the air component, maritime component in that joint space. And I, I think there is a need to, as I said, to really double down in the joint space, as well as play catch up, frankly, in those areas that we have not hitherto been uh, you know as as focused on which has been uh, the cyber domain i think we've been doing that for actually cyber and C cyber and sema for quite some time but the space domain being a very significant kind of game changer uh, out there in terms of the way that we operate and that is absolutely relevant to the to the core headquarters but the core headquarters as a core headquarters you know we we seek to add that utility in in demonstrable and credible uh, ability to command as you said large scale operations, the five to seven divisions and, and all those assembled core troops, uh, but also uh, to offer options uh, within the DDA as you talk about the transition from peace to crisis to conflict and, and seeking to be able to offer options that you don't provoke, but you are able to control escalation as it were. 
no, none of that's easy for for an organization such as NATO which is defensive in its in its construct so you're you're often not the first responder but we need to be you know more agile in the way that we do use readiness and we do exploit readiness and I think that's very explicit in some of those summit declarations and where we're going with um, uh, NRI, the, the NATO Readiness uh, Initiative, uh, and being held, you know, held to account for our readiness, but also using readiness uh, as an engine for adaptation and to deploy for that tangible kind of an effect. To to keep messaging, to keep make, you know that that to, to those deployments as part of the overall NATO messaging campaign, but with a very focused view of what that means in terms of deterrence. Uh, not easy because it's so multifaceted. And you can't just pick a bit of geography. You know, there's the, the flanks increasingly you can see are, are deeply important. And, and part of that in terms of being able to, to respond effectively to them is understanding their mindset. And I'm not sure whether you both feel that, uh, th that NATO is still caught in a nuclear conversation that elevates it to a strategic level, whereas our adversaries are more happy to threaten the use of tactical level. I mean, you know, the, uh, nuclear de-escalation through, you know, the potential use or the threat of tactical nuclear weapons is just a standard thing that we are, many analysts are expecting from any sort of Russian small land grab. Do you think that NATO is in a position to have this conversation? I mean, you know, nuclear to many Europeans has just become this enormous question that, that really can't be answered and, and, and really isn't even tackled. Are we, as you know, Chris Parry raises this question, are we ready to apply a dose of realism to ourselves and the adversary in, in us understanding what it takes to use or threaten to use nuclear weapons at a tactical level rather than a strategic one? Which of us do you want to answer? Yeah, let's start with you, Jack, first. Give okay. John some time to think. Um, yeah, sensitive. <laughs> I, I, th I think there are, you know, there are quite a lot of examples during the Cold War um, in the early stages of Vietnam, certainly in Korea, um, and actually after the Cold War in 1991, where adversaries believing that nuclear weapons were on the table fundamentally changed their calculus. Um, and so having that conversation um, can genuinely have a deterrent effect. Uh, you know, Saddam Hussein didn't deploy chemical weapons in 1991, partly because he thought there would be a nuclear response, um, which there wouldn't have been. You know, the Americans, that wasn't the intention, but the Americans very intentionally left it ambiguous as to whether it was. Um, and so, you know, if, you, if you're thinking about um, escalation dynamics, actually that is a part of the conversation which has to be there, however uncomfortable it makes us. The only thing I would flag is that I don't think that, um, I don't think you should dabble with the idea of tactical nuclear weapons in a, you know, as a, as a, from a doctrinal point of view. There is a question around having a public conversation around how, what the thresholds are where you escalate uh, in that way. But the reality is, um, if you want to take nuclear capabilities off the table, the answer needs to be a nuclear attack against NATO is a nuclear attack and will be responded to in kind, and that's the deterrence posture. Um, it needs to be very hard line and very clear because I don't think um, I don't think the alliance or in fact any state can afford uh, in today's environment accepting that logic of, of tactical nuclear exchange. Um, so while the conversation needs to be had uh, and what our adversaries might do needs to be explored, um, I think we should be pretty clear about keeping that as a very high and hard threshold. John. I, I mean, I think the, the the policies and the deterrence theory here uh, is pretty well laid out, you know, nationally and, and and across NATO, in you know controlling escalation. If we get into that Article Five kind of space, I think almost the more interesting question, uh, which is you know the paper alludes to, is working through, and this is not in relation to those, those that kind of strategic escalation, is Article Three into Article Four, and you know how you control escalation with um, across domains and with more as their term conventional capabilities to prevent the kind of bite and hole um, scenarios that um, that Jack alludes to so I, I think that's 
you know, that's the really interesting discussion about deter and deterring those, those kind of, you know, limited policy objectives, which are still, you know, very strategically significant as we're, as we're seeing in, you know, parts of, uh, of Eastern Europe and, and other parts of the world at the moment. So one of the one of the things that's coming up in a lot of the questions, uh, you know, from Petra and Raphael, uh, is is the question over the initiative. I mean, it feels as if NATO is very much on the back foot. Um, you know, whether it's in the high north, the fielding of hypersonics, uh, the uh, political appetite to go further. You know, Simon Webb raises this idea of hypersonics. Sevi talks about the feel that Russia is winning, winning the media war. I mean, you know. There, there is a there is a feeling that, that Russia is ahead and that, that NATO is just simply being very reactive. How does rather than each one of those, how does the initiative play into this deterrence calculus? So, so there are um, there are two major sections of the paper that deal with these very precise questions, um, and I'll give two quick responses. One of the reasons why Russia is so far ahead in terms of some areas of land capability is that NATO has fundamentally underestimated how much they spend on defense. Um, and that's because CIPRI and other organizations measure Russian military expenditure in dollars, when whereas we purchase a lot of uh, defense equipment in dollars, the Russians uh, produce it or buy it in rubles to pay their own domestic companies, which are state companies that get resources from state companies. Uh, and as I gave the example of them selling oil to Belarus at four dollars a barrel, the costs for Russian defense industry are substantially lower. So when you look at their budget on a uh, purchasing power parity measure, they're spending about $159 billion a year on defense. And all of a sudden, the gap between NATO's expenditure other than the US and Russia becomes stark and evident. Um, so that's one issue. But the other issue is initiative, which you've said. Um, and I think you know we have for the last 30 years been an environment where we are supremely reactive in our policy making at a strategic level. Uh, I, go, I go into some detail on this on the paper. Essentially our national security structures are um, designed and have been calibrated to react to single incidents, mono crises, largely terrorist attacks, um, where you put everyone into the room because it's a crisis and it's all about how quickly can you coordinate a response. Um, the reality is, you know, if Russia manages to seize a bit of territory, it is going to be disproportionately difficult to dislodge them, and they can start hardening the theater. And if there is a gap between the delay in defensive operations of forces already engaged in there, then taking the ground and a counterattack, if there is a gap, then that is where Russian threats of tactical nuclear use and so forth become really powerful political levers that could deter us doing anything at all. Um, you know, we not saying that we should have responded in that way to Ukraine, but the option was never really on the table. And if you're reactive and slow in terms of your decision making, doesn't matter how many tanks you have, doesn't matter how many divisions you could theoretically generate, you know, it doesn't matter because they're not in the field. Um, and so we need, to, if we are going to be effective in deterrence, then we need to be much more proactive, not in using force necessarily, um, but in setting up our capability to apply it. Because otherwise, we fall down on the credibility question. Uh, and, you know, so we need to get much better at doing things in advance. And actually, just to show, highlight a, a recent failure in that regard, you know, when we seized the Grace One off Gibraltar, it was predicted by every analyst on the subject that you could speak to that the Iranians would seize a British tanker in response. Uh, officials knew it was going to happen. When it happened, it was a crisis. You know, people were running in to meetings, having not been briefed particularly. Uh, the Department of Transport Board got put in charge of the response, who had never been briefed really on Iran or defense matters at the time, because they held the economic risk. Um, and it was then predicted that Russia, sorry, that uh, Iran would escalate uh, further because of their lack of response from us. We essentially just gave them what they wanted. We let their tanker go. It went to Syria, even though we told them, asked them not to do it. Um, so the further escalation was also predicted and happened. They, you know, there was a cruise missile strike against a British ally against whom we, well, for, to whom we made defence commitments. No response. Um, a further escalation, which was also predicted, and we were just sitting on our hands most of that time. In fact, most of the options, proactive options to deter that activity, 
were never presented to policymakers. Uh, they were de-risked, we never got there. So fundamentally, yes, we need a change in mindset if we're going to do this well. John, are you allowed to come in on this question? Uh, on bits of it. The, um, I, I think, you know, the initiative, or, you know, there is a fascinating question always militarily. I mean, ta tactically, you know, maybe we don't hold the initiative in some areas, but you could argue politically and technologically, uh, we, we have a 71 years of, of NATO's existence in terms of unity of effort um, and the strength of that, of that alliance and what that brings in terms of strategic initiative, which I think is deeply, deeply significant and we shouldn't take for granted. We need to keep constantly re reinforcing, which I hope I, I made the point there. And, and I think the change situation has been recognized as a, in those summit declarations and practically now is, as a gearing mechanism with our plans. And, and the DDA is the, is the kind of clearest manifestation of that. And I would say aligned to the DDA is the new NATO warfighting capstone concept, which is more about the capability North Star for where we're needing to aim for. Uh, and then that's a discussion between the, between the 30 nations about where people focus their, their efforts. And, you, and you've heard some of the UK policy aspects about multi-domain integration and how that fits into fusion doctrine. And each, each country has, has their kind of niches and, and, their, and their opportunities within that. But there are some tough choices around what Jack was talking about, about balanced force and how much of a balanced force uh, one can afford and, and what that means in terms of national policy choices. But I think there is that, that, that kind of key generational moment now in terms of those unity of, of plans and, and effort that those documents and a new NATO military strategy um, is giving us. And, it, and of course, there are then considerations about force posture and locations of bases and, 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 and the like. And this is an example of, of initiative, which which really do put us on the forward foot because it means we have a tripwire that's present and in place. No, we, we are we are running out of time really, really quickly. And there are there are some brilliant questions from, you know, Frank Hoffman, Damien Turner uh, and others. Really good. But there are some big questions. Uh, I guess the theme that we've not really covered is exercises and readiness. You know, this idea that, you know, you can only deter if you have a credible force to deter them with. NATO on paper looks very impressive, but in reality, we know there's problems with, with readiness, mobility, uh, and, and all sorts of uh, other parts to it. Madeline Moon raises this great question, you know, should we, instead of just striving for the best constantly and, and, and you know, numerous exercises, and, and NATO never seems to stop talking about how many exercises it does, Madeline posed the question, should we agree a mutually agreed verifiable reduction of military exercises? Now, she puts this in response to uh, COVID-19, but the idea of a sort of uh, a Korean level agreement on reducing military exercises, is that something that would work in terms of a, a deterrence posture with Russia? Or is it something that really just wouldn't meet the aims at all? I, I think exercises are really, really important um, as a way of making, you know, uh, General John can talk about this with much more authority than I can, but um, I was speaking to a US, former US school commander recently, who made the point that unless you have recently tried to move all your kit across internal EU borders, and unless you know which officials to phone when, uh, and how to pull everyone together, then it takes an inordinate amount of time. You know, making those things efficient and fast and who to call when and how to coordinate it requires practice. And so exercises are fundamentally important to being able to do that. I mean, I think that's one of the things that we would be remiss to cut back on, really. Um, and, and if anything, the question isn't so much around uh, re re you know, reducing exercises. It's more around how do we maximise what we get out of them? Um, and one of the problems there, I think, is that you know, there is a, a tendency for NATO states to want to you know, show themselves off in a very uh, impressive way to their allies. That leads to a level of scripting and exercise, which I think sometimes undermines the impressiveness that you might communicate to an adversary. Um, and so, you know, I think some of us might need to uh, reassess the level to which we want to look good in when we exercise versus 
being, it, it being acceptable to fail uh, in exercise so that you can genuinely test capability and most likely demonstrate capability, which is really important. Thanks, Jack. And uh, General John, any final points on, on exercise as you see it? Uh, well, I think they're, they're our lifeblood, but we don't use them to, to provoke. Uh, we use them to, to unify, uh, to align behind common procedures, um, to, to, you know, to make sure that we really can concentrate across those uh, efforts and actions across those uh, five domains. So they're, they're a lifeblood of NATO. I mean, the question is, is a reasonable one if those dialogue levels are open at levels well above me uh, uh, in terms of de-escalation but um, you know come and visit us in in November we we use them for for clear targeted effect but most of that effect is about unifying actions making sure that NATO is ever more interoperable. Uh, gentlemen thank you very much indeed a really an enlightening uh, discussion those of you who hadn't read Jack's paper it's free it's on the RUSI website uh, go and download it. It's a really good read. Um, to, to those who posed questions, and I didn't get them through to the, to the panellists, it's nothing to do with your questions. It's all to do with me uh, being uh, poor at time management and not getting the speakers through them fast enough. So I do apologise, but the speakers will read all of them, uh, and they were really valuable. Thank you so much for participating. If you enjoyed this discussion, you can find out more about our research at rusi.org forward slash milsai. You can find all Jack's previous work under his bio uh, in the Rusi uh, title. You can listen to podcasts and other exciting stuff uh, that's going on. And we look forward to seeing you at the next one of these events. I guess the next one for this audience that might be interesting is James Heapy, uh, Minister of the Armed Forces in the UK, is going to come in tomorrow and is having a discussion uh, with Malcolm Chalmers, our Deputy Director General, about the UK forces' uh, response to COVID-19. But as it is, thank you very much for joining us. Gentlemen, thank you very much. And from Rusi, farewell.